Greetings, sir and sirettes, and welcome back to From the Depths with me, Lathrix. And of course, welcome at last to the episode in which we go back into the campaign. Now, the votes have been counted, and by a very slim margin, the White Flyers and the Onyx Watch have won. So we will be facing off against two factions at once. Once both of those are defeated, I will be fighting the Lightning Hoods, although I do have an idea about that. Rather than defeating both of the factions, we are going to be fighting. As soon as we win against one, I will then bring the Lightning Hoods into the war to continue to fight against two separate opponents at once. Now, the vehicle you see in front of you is the new and improved, and even uglier, Shriven. Except for now, it is remarkably powerful. The old Shriven was fairly good. This one has a very, very nasty laser indeed. And at last, we are using a continuous laser, so rather than shooting in bursts, it shoots 40 shots per second to do continuous damage. Each shot does around about 150 damage at an armor penetration value at 16. And the reason why we can have it so powerful is because we have converted it fully to steam engines and we've also made it a hovercraft. Because hovercrafts are just absolute love at the moment, I adore them beyond almost any other type of vehicle. We have 13,000 engine power and a massive energy reserve. We could have gone with the standard steam engine which just makes engine power, but by having the energy reserve like this, it means even if the engines get completely obliterated, we should have around about 30 seconds left of continuous fire. It also means we don't instantly sink from where we are currently, as of course if the engine normally gets destroyed, we crash into the floor, like we've seen several times with the blood letter. The blood letter, on that note, has also been upgraded to steam engines. Before we go back into the campaign though, let's have a quick demonstration of the new Shriven's lasers by killing an old version of the Shriven. So let's turn on the weaponry and let's see how long it takes to cause this thing to go AI dead. And it's done. It may not have looked like it was doing much, but it went all the way through, all the way through all of this engine and destroyed both some of the flooring and the AI. This thing is going to be hideously powerful against pretty much any opponent except for heavy armor users. Heavy armor has a very high armor value in addition to a very high health, which actually renders the laser incredibly ineffective. It takes a very, very long time to melt through anything with that high an armor value, actually. How high is the armor value of heavy armor? It is indeed 40, and we only have an armor penetration of 16, which of course is more than enough for metal, which is an only an armor value of 10. But yeah, if any opponents have heavy armor, we still have nothing to counter that. But at least it does a lot of damage, so even with that reduction, it will work, just not quite as good. So now, finally back into the campaign to load in our new vehicles, or at least our upgraded vehicles, and make war with two separate factions. I'm also going to set up some buildings at last, some very, very simple buildings which will act as our, res our resource transporters so we don't have to keep on using our little transport vehicles because honestly, it's just more reliable and much easier to set up permanently. Here we are back in the campaign and it's time to retrofit the vehicles we already have. So all of the Krulls are turning into their new version, which is far, far cheaper, so we're going to get some resource back, and it's time to turn the Blood Letters into the version 7, which is the far more aggressive version, which now has the steam engines installed. So let's put all of those like so, make them all repair themselves so they're all nice and ready for action, and then we can get to work building our vehicles. Now sometimes when you retrofit, you do have to put them into play briefly so that the repair actually works. Not always, but sometimes it does kind of glitch out like that. Working now? Okay, good, now it's working. 
There we are, everything as it should be. The blood letters are now the version 7, with the steam engines and the more powerful guns, and the Krull are all now the cheaper variant, the version 2, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, another reason why we've gone for such energy heavy steam engines rather than simply going for straight into engine power is because steam engines do take quite a long time to ramp up. However, energy is always held. So once they've reached maximum energy, and and that energy is being converted into engine power, it means they will always start off the fight at maximum engine power, and then by the time the steam engines have sped up, they will then have the energy being replenished again, and everything is fine. If we just have it in a more standard way, which is definitely more volume efficient, sometimes at the start of the battle there's going to be some issues. A lot of technical mumbo jumbo. Well, there we are, a very trippy looking building to pass on resources from one place to the next. I wanted it to look a little bit more sci-fi than the other things we've been building, because it is essentially going to be teleporting resources across the map very, very quickly. I originally built this using proper, complete, perfect circles, and it looked utterly boring when it was spinning, so instead we've gone for more oval shapes which are a little bit more bulged in the centre, and it looks more like this, which looks really wobbly and really distorted as it spins, which I'm very, very happy with. Now sadly, these are a little bit expensive on the resource side, because each of those light blocks in the centre, which are the invisible blocks with the lines in between them, are 100 resource each, so a bit wasteful, but I think it's quite pretty, I think it's quite silly, and we're going to build about 20 of these to connect all of our resource zones together. Once that is done, we will start the war. Look at all those lovely numbers. So here we are, we have our first resource zone connecting to our second resource zone, which is now going along and is soon to connect to the non-infinite resource zone over there. I've also started work on the buildings on the land marauder side of things, so that should be built up fairly soon as well. One tip I would like to say, if you are ever building a system like this, first of all, don't do what I've done and build expensive buildings. I'm only doing that because it's interesting and it makes the video a little bit more different. Just build a single resource block. That's it, that's all you need, and then you can do this in moments. But the second tip is actually against that, I guess. Then, add a single repair tentacle. That way, you can simply split off the building, make a new version, move it down, build it there, and the original building will then be able to build the second building, which can then build the third building, and so on and so forth, and then it's done in moments. Because our buildings are something like 3,000 resource each, it's taking me a little bit longer, but thankfully, now we've connected a lot of the resource zones together, it's actually getting done a lot faster. So, just because I don't want to give a bad impression to people trying to learn from the depths from watching my videos, this is how you should do this, not the silly thing I'm doing. You should build a building of simply a single raw resource container, or any other resource container you would like, and then you add a repair tentacle to it. Upon doing this, you have everything you could possibly need. I can't add it right now, because I don't have enough resources nearby, but upon doing that, this will actually do the exact same job as the items I've been building will do, just incredibly cheap. There's no other item needed. I think maybe you might need a regular block to connect these two elements together at the most, and then that's that. And honestly, you could always just have a transport vehicle as well. It does the same thing, and the only reason why I'm doing this is because I find it fun, and it's something interesting to do for me. Not very effective, not very efficient. Some people will get somewhat angry about that, but fun is fun. That does look really cool, having these littering the landscape. As soon as they're somewhere mountainous, I'll have to have a look at that as well. I can only imagine it will look really cool having them going over different terrain, which isn't quite as even. Now what I could do is remove some of these light blocks, because we don't need them in all four directions, we only need them in one direction. I do like seeing that, how they alternate as they spin, which makes them look very, again, very trippy, very sci-fi and a little bit creepy. I don't know, maybe I'll do that. And this will be the last time I update about this lovely resource pipeline, because it is getting a little bit tedious. So, as soon as it's built, we'll be right back, and hopefully into some action.
absolutely beautiful and very disturbing. This monstrosity, this vine system is now all nicely connected up and all of the resources are very quickly being funneled to our original base in which I am now able to create the new Shriven, the new Krull, the new Bloodletter in somewhat high numbers. Our forces are going to rack up very very quickly which is something we are really going to need. So I ended up caving in and I ended up making the transport building a lot cheaper. I've removed almost all of the light blocks, so it's gone from 4,000 resource each to only 700-ish, which is obviously a lot less. So because of that, it was a lot easier to make this creepy vein system, which will eventually strangle the entire map, and that's why I've built them so closely together. So when you zoom out all of the way, they kind of connect, and I just want the last shot of this series to be this vein system, this root system, whatever you want to call it, the blood god's veins, to be covering the entire map. It's really dark and I absolutely adore it. Well, here we go then. It's time to begin the war. We have two Shriven, we have two of the newest version of the Krull, and we have a version 7 Bloodletter. In addition to this, we have the original group of three Bloodletters and three Krull. So what's going to happen is the bottom group here with the Shriven is going to defend against the White Flyers, which will be coming up from the south most likely, and the original group will be defending against the Onyx Watch from the north and the east. So hopefully we can survive their initial onslaughts today, learn what they're using because I've still stayed completely spoiler free from how they do things. I can only assume the Onyx Watch is going to be very heavy into cram cannons and armor and the White Flyers are going to be very quick moving and with a lot of ramming potential. So let's begin war with both of them and see how we do. So, relationships, hello there Onyx Watch, you're a bugger, and White Flyer's the same insult to you. Leaving only the Twin Guard friendly with us. As soon as we knock out one of the enemies, we will, repli yeah, we will replace that enemy with the Lightning Hoods. All the words there are getting very confusing. The satellite's already in place, so we can see what's happening. Let's unpause. And you can move over there, although one of you isn't saved correctly, so we have the wrong speed. So I'll spawn them back in, make sure they can actually move, so they can move correctly over there a little bit faster when they're pulled out. One of you isn't moving, which one? No, you all seem to be moving fairly quickly. Also, I do have to mention that the Shriven are an absolute nightmare when it comes to draining materials. I definitely can't have more than two at any given time because they are using a lot of materials to power those lasers. Well, here's something weird I've just found out. It turns out the steam engines don't require material to produce energy when they're not in a battle, when they're not spawned in, which means right now they're just replenishing their batteries for no material cost. Another reason to use batteries over just having the standard engines. So we have White Flyers all the way down here and Onyx Watch up there. We could attack them, but I am waiting for at least the first attack. If they don't attack us within the next five minutes of me sitting here, I'm going to start attacking them so that we can push towards the enemy. I think I'll probably go against the Onyx Watch first. Oh dear. Okay, so we finally have the attacks from both the White Flyers and the Onyx Watch. The Onyx Watch thankfully lost some of their forces by taking this tile, so hopefully it won't be too difficult to defeat the remaining tanks. There are only five vehicles, which makes it a fairly fair fight, in fact. The White Flyers, on the other hand, have not had to do that, so we'll see just how powerful these four vehicles are. Well, on the surface of things, it seems like the Onyx Watch sent far more, but obviously I haven't fought these units before, so I don't really have a clue. Before the Onyx Watch reach us, sadly, we are going to have to quickly remove the missile launchers on the blood letters, because it turns out they are suffering from a bug I've seen quite a few times, in which if you add a missile launcher to a standard turret which is using a different weapon, such as advanced cannons, it will stop the advanced cannon from being able to fire up and down. It can only fire straight ahead. It's a weird thing, which I'm not quite sure what causes it, but I have fixed it 
in the past, like when I added missiles to the Khan and even missiles to the Angron. But after seeing a quick test fire just now, yeah, that's completely bugged out. So no missiles for these guys, but at least that means more ammo for the guns themselves, as they load up before the fight. Thankfully, after they're loaded up, they can fire for like a minute and a half, so... I'm sure they'll do fine. The Onyx Watch were actually the first to catch up with us, so let's set up the battle. The Krulls obviously going at the back with their new actually long range weaponry, and the Bloodletters at the front to try and take some of the hits and to try and actually do most of the damage. So the crawls go to the side. Now I am a little bit concerned because I'm not sure if the Bloodletters AI is going to work correctly with their new guns. I've only tested them firing with me manually firing them. I haven't checked their detection systems since I made all of the changes. So there's a chance we're going to see some weirdness, but that's just that. Oh wow, okay, so the one enemy type is called the Bison with 3000 volume and 67,000 material cost and a speed of 40 meters per second. That's actually faster than the Bloodletter. Well done, Onyx Watch. The other type of tank they have has 2,800 volume with 23,000 material, and then another Bison and another Bison. Here's hoping the Bison aren't too powerful. Well, let's just begin and find out. And so here we go. So which tank is which on the enemy side? The one at the front there is indeed the Bison. And now I can see how it gets its speed. Look at how many wheels they have added to this craft. That is ridiculous, and so many cannons. So two cram cannon turrets at the top, one stationary very large cram cannon facing forwards, and then loads of little ones on the side, and a really cool radiator setup on the back, which looks really, really cool. And they have still stayed with their castle aesthetic, which I'm very much a fan of. The one thing I am actually a little bit glad for though is these side cannons. Because they have explosive barrels, explosive warheads, if we can get through just that layer of armour, they're probably going to detonate. Perhaps less tanky than they, than they actually look, but we'll see as the fight continues. Not the best round of shooting there from either of those bloodletters. This one on the other hand getting a lot more hits in, especially at the back. And there goes one of the bison's back sections, apparently highly explosive indeed. Nowhere near as much armor as I originally thought. Okay, cram cannons being shot at the Krull. The missiles are finally arriving after the advanced cannons have done a lot of work. Once again, advanced cannons just crushing the enemy there. The explosive shots just barely missing the Krull. One enemy is now AI dead. This one is being caught between two blood letters, and my lord, those guns are so effective. Oh, I'm so proud of those cannons. It's... I took pride building those. The back section of that uh, second tank whose name now escapes me being utterly obliterated. It's like a laser how fast it hits. One enemy remains, now being shot by two of the Bloodletters, and down it goes! The missiles from the Krull finally arriving. Oh my lord, that was a massacre! The Blood God is proud this day! Just in case anyone doesn't believe me, because someone was actually saying about this in the last episode, here's the campaign options, difficulty modifier on one. I increased it before, I decreased it back to one, I've never gone underneath one, yeah. I'm okay, I do feel a little bit bad there, I think I may have made the blood letters a bit too powerful. 1250 rounds per minute of beautiful frag action, and with the enemies not having shields, all of the fragments were going straight through. In fact, I could remove the inertial fuse since we're not facing enemies with shields, but saying that, we haven't seen the White Flyers yet. Maybe the Onyx Watch are a less difficult faction than we thought. It is very possible they're just less difficult. In most of the campaigns, they are normally the second enemy you face off against, after the Deepwater Guard, or of course the Dustwind Gypsies. Or perhaps we just fought a couple of easy tanks, that's also very, very possible. Will the White Flyers do better than the Onyx Watch? So against us we have the Ravager, the Chaos, the Cataphract, 
think I'm pronouncing that correctly, probably wrong to be perfectly honest, and then we also have the Slayer. Now the center one is indeed called Chaos, so instantly I adore it no matter how good or bad it is. It's a 5,717 meter volume craft with 78,000 materials going into it, and by the looks of things, they are all tanks, or at least all ground units, so that's pretty good for us. So the Shriven will go at the front. We are going to be keeping a close eye on how well the Shriven's lasers do. In terms of the detection system and everything else, it should work out perfectly okay because they're essentially using the old Shriven systems but the laser is very different. If it doesn't do too well, we simply go back to the pulsed version, and then the new version with the pulsed version should be doing around about three times the damage. I'm really hoping that this is a good continuous laser, because I have never been able to make a good continuous laser. Let's go on there. And let's see how we do. And so the battle begins. We have the Slayer at the back, which turns out very well might be an airborne, or at least some kind of hovercraft or something. It kind of looks like a really nasty wheel-based weapon on skis. Honestly, that is far scarier than it sounds, to be perfectly honest. It also does indeed have shields. We have the Chaos here in the middle, which is absolutely huge, and has particle cannons hidden underneath what seems to be... I'm not sure if that's going to spin or not, but it's definitely a melee weapon of sorts. We then have the Cataphract, still hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, and there is the Ravager. Okay, let's see how the lasers do particularly. Lasers having trouble locking onto the target, but they are doing a fair bit of damage now they are, and the combined forces of laser and advanced cannon deal with the Ravager fairly quickly, although... The missiles from the enemy have dealt with the Bloodletter. The Bloodletter has been removed from the fight, and in fact, it was both missiles and advanced cannon shots. Missiles coming in from the Krulls. As the enemy Chaos heads towards one of our Shriven, thankfully not getting close enough, and wow! The enemy Cataphracts going underneath the Shriven. What is that? That is the Slayer. The Slayer seems to be having trouble writing itself. Okay. Chaos there at the back, firing its parcel cannon, thankfully missing its, well, the bulk of shots. Missiles hitting the Shriven, doing mild damage. The White Flyer's kind of looking a bit silly right now. No, don't laser each other! Oh, wow. The Chaos successfully meleeing the Shriven in half. The Shriven's laser is not as powerful as I first thought. That is a bit concerning for its extremely high cost. Every second, that's costing me 15 materials, or 16 materials. I can't quite remember. It's very expensive. The Chaos coming round again, trying to go for the Shriven. Laser doing very little to stop it, and here it comes! Just just a bit too low. The rams on the side hit it the first time, well, the other Shriven, which is now dead. Yeah, not happy with how it's aiming, so clearly the detection system is a little bit, well, very off. Oh, I see. The problem is, with the continuous laser, it needs to always lock onto the target, which means it needs to have 0.1 seconds between every update with the weapon. Because it's on, zero, well, one second or something, every time it has to delay, it simply keeps on firing where it was firing before. It would be perfectly accurate if it was firing a normal gun, but it's not. Wow, that cannon is terrifying. Oh, just underneath it again! And I'm guessing that's a graphical glitch? It must be. Yeah, it definitely is. We can see it hitting, that's definitely a graphical glitch. It's not firing like that. It would be impossible to be so accurate. The Krull are both thankfully still alive, as the Chaos is still focusing on the Shriven. I don't even know if it's firing, that's really weird. Where am I currently? I'm on the floor, okay. I was going to manual fire- OH NO! The Shriven being melee'd- melee'd? melee by the Chaos! 
Are you actually fi I have no idea. Okay, I'm just gonna jump on that to see if we can manually fire it to see what to see what's going on. Can I zoom out so I can see what I'm doing? Thank you. Hi Shriven. How you doing, bud? I don't know okay, I'm pressing fire. It definitely is firing because it's using up the engine power. There we go. I just had to make it stop firing for a second for the graphics to come back. I can't repair this right now because because of the repair bots currently working, it kind of bugs out and I can't use my repair tentacles. The chaos may be victorious here. Why are you so tanky? The missiles from the Krull are doing nothing. I think it might be the self-repair. Look how fast that thing's repairing. Oh, second run from the chaos against the Shriven. We are damaging slower than it's healing. The healing rate of this thing is insane. It also has a lot more heavy armor than I originally thought. Just underneath this layer is a second layer of heavy armor. Oh no, it's going after the Krull. Keep on firing, you might be able to hit a weak spot if it has one. Building bigger is definitely better in this game, and this is a good example. This is a good vehicle. And a very cool one as well, very heavily themed. Missiles incoming against the Krull. Sliding their way to hit it, and thankfully not doing all that much damage. The cannon, though, is now actually hitting the target. It's very inaccurate, but of course, if it gets close enough, that really doesn't matter. Yeah, slide. I would use magnets on these, but then we'd have to sacrifice either fuel or fins or a warhead, and it's just not worth it. Why have a magnet when I could simply have an extra fuel tank? Oh no. Oh, this is painful to watch. Oh, look at that. Krull, do you remember when you were a melee vehicle? Because that's how you started life. It's being slowed by the debris of what it's killing. I could capture this vehicle by jumping onto this Krull, but that would be unfair. It's deserved its victory. Yeah, lots of heavy armor. That's what that problem was. Nothing could deal with it. And the Shriven need to be reworked again, because that was not good enough. That's just mocking me. That's just mocking me. Why are you so mean? Oh, its steam engines are now leaking. The last Krull might have a chance. This must be a fairly recent design, then, if it has steam engines. Now it doesn't have as much speed, it's going to take a lot longer to get to the Krull, and the Krull is going to try to get away. It's designed and set up, so it tries to get away if the target's within 1,500 meters. It also means the enemy cannot replenish its cannon that fast. Oh dear, it's speeding up again. Run! Krull, please run. Just run. Yeah, it's turning around to run, but it, it can only move at 22 meters. This thing is at l minimum 50 for the group's m minimum speed. Oh, I'm watching this. Oh, it's so sad. Thankfully, the Krull is only a 14,000 resource vehicle. It's not too expensive to lose, and I didn't think we were going to win this anyway, but it's kind of sad. Oh, the missiles incoming. Oh, there goes the Krull. Two perfect hits directly where the ammunition storage is. And the refinery. Pause time for a second so we can watch this. Um, if I go into this, can I put this into slow motion? No, I can't. Okay, I'm not sure how slow really motion- Really sorry for the cut there. So what happened was for some reason the game minimized itself. I was looking at hotkeys and what I could have done to do that, and it seems like the game just tried to crash, or Steam was trying to update, or something. I don't know what just happened, but either way, the last bit of recording was simply cut off. The enemy still defeated the Krull, the battle continued as you would expect, nothing major happened. After that, the enemy went after our satellites, and of course I just gave up when the battle started. 
started because the satellite can't even fight. So here we are with three of the Krull, three of the Blood Letters, which I've just moved down to fight the White Flyers. And we're going to have to repair that group. And the Shriven need to have their lasers changed. Big time. So here we go. Blood letters as clo well, not, well, not as close as possible, but closer than the Krulls. And let's spread them out as much as possible so when it tries to melee, it's going to have to go everywhere. And then we'll have the Krull back here. Thankfully, the enemy is still at almost half health. Well, actually, exactly one quarter down. So at least it's got a bit of a handicap at the start of the battle. Sorry for how dark it is. Apparently, this battle is going to happen at night time. So nothing I can really do about that. I'll try to brighten it a little bit in editing, but it is essentially pitch black. I can hardly see what's going on here. So if you can see things, you can see more than me. Face the wrath of the blood letters. Incoming the Krull's missiles. That Krull just flipped over. Not quite sure what's going on there. It could be. Actually, I know exactly what just happened. That's the recoil. And that is the PID system failing because of the steam engine not being charged up enough. Because I had to repair it. And that's what just happened there. So that's my fault. It's still firing though, despite being upside down, and it took all of those volleys. It's still alive, still alive. I think now it, yep, finally two damaged. And that's with us having a massive force advantage. The chaos is terrifying, and the blood letter managed to right itself because the blood letter is built so much better than the Shriven. Okay, so missiles incoming from the enemy, thankfully running out of fuel. Well, the White Flyers are definitely scarier than the Onyx Watch, at least from the very limited amount of enemies we've seen so far. The Shriven need a lot of work, the Krull is still doing fantastically for its cost, and my god, the Blood Letters new version of their cannon is just amazing. It's easily one of the better weapons I've made because of how small it is. We could fit... I think on my smallest battleship from the previous season, we could easily fit 10 of these on that battleship. At minimum, we could fit 10, because they are absolutely tiny. So, really proud of the Blood Letters, not proud of the Shriven, terrified of Sorry the about the sharp cut yet again during this video, but sadly the phone did go off just as I was finishing off. Of course, that is my luck. So, like I was going to say, in the next episode we are going to have to deal with the forces of the Onyx Watch currently located in the two tiles above our main base. And after that, certainly rethink our defense force on the southern front, because right now, the White Flyers are definitely defeating the Shriven group, so the Shriven needs to be upgraded, and perhaps we can add a couple of changes to the Krull to make their missiles a little bit more effective against this particular enemy. But with all of that out of the way, thank you so much for watching. If you have enjoyed, then of course, likes, favourites, shares, comments, all that good stuff helps out me, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that From the Depths is a series you wish to see continued in the future. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye. And now I'm off to work, working on the Shriven.